In this module, we are going to have an overview of Chef. I am Damien Caro, Technical Evangelist at Microsoft. And I'm Steve Murawski. I'm a Community Software Development Engineer at Chef. In this module, we're going to set the stage around Chef. We're going to understand how Chef is infrastructure as code. We're going to drill into the ecosystem and how Chef has built an ecosystem around its technologies. And we're going to see how the technology work for Chef and how the different topics fit together. Great. So just to kind of set the stage for uh, how or why this type of technology, why automation is important. You know, right now we, we're in a time where the pace of business is increasing. And so speed and uh, getting the time to market is just so, so critical. You can't do it all manually. And if you are doing it manually, you're at a severe competitive disadvantage to those who are not. So. You know, we, we reach for we reach for automation tools, and Chef kind of falls into that space. And we like to think that you know that this automation can help you improve your speed, your consistency of delivery of your service, and the scale at which you can deliver your service. So, um, one of the you know one of the most tricky aspects of that is scale. Um, you know. We can, all, we can always get faster, we can always automate things and, and make them, um, you know, we can always tweak and tune and, and get them faster and faster and faster. We can make them more consistent. Uh, aut automation technologies like scripting and things, um, and uh, creating build pipelines, continuous delivery pipelines, things like that can make them more consistent. Where things get really tricky is at scale, because now we have so much to track, we need ways to reduce that complexity. So. You know, just to kind of dive into some of the challenges of scale, you know, number one, you have size. Uh, when I first started in systems administration, I had two servers. By the time I was working as an IT uh, guy for a municipal police department, and we had two servers. We had a Windows box and a Linux box. <laughs> and <laughs> That sounds familiar yeah, to me. Yeah, and uh, by the time I left there, which was uh, about three years later, we had about 40 servers. And uh, you know, from you know, we went from having you know that one Windows server which ran Active Directory and Exchange. It was a small business yeah, server, small you business. know. And so it went from that to having uh, you know multiple domain controllers, uh, SQL servers, uh, you know, different uh, web ser web application servers, SharePoint, you know, just the whole gamut of stuff in the environment. And that was for a relatively small environment, you know, eighty users or so. And as the, as the number of servers rose, the complexity of managing that stuff rose. Now you take that to you know modern day enterprise where you're running hundreds of internal applications, if not thousands of internal applications, and the the and multiple multiple different application stacks, whether it's Java, .NET. You know sometimes you're going to have cr the cross platform story in the mix where you're managing Windows and Linux. And so the complexity of what you manage just starts spiraling out of control, and, and you need to you need something to put patterns on top of this, so that you can reduce that complexity and deal with uh, and deal with it in a, in a consistent manner. And so we we talk about Chef as being you know the automation platform for web scale IT, and web scale kind of embodies this whole concept of you know. Fast, uh, fast time to market, large numbers of servers, dealing with a, a lot of uh, you know, uh, be always on consistent delivery, and whether you're in web operations or whether you're in enterprise support uh, or whether you're in a small shop, you know, the the things that make a web scale IT environment are beneficial across all of these organizations. So, you know, we, we're facing these challenges. We need some automation tools to deal with that. And so we need this automation platform. And the automation platform, it really provides a way to create this dependable, reproducible structure of our environment. You know, it needs to be able to handle dependencies across things. So, you know, 
I can't deploy my web app until I have my SQL server in place. I can't deploy SQL server until I, in, in, uh, in its always on availability group, until I have Active Directory and clustering in place. And you know, so you, you have all of these contingencies, and, and I can't serve that content until my web, ser my, my web servers are registered in my load balancers. And all of this stuff can change over time. So we need a platform that can, as we add components, can reach out and structure them so that we have, you know, our load balancers become aware of our web servers. Our web servers are aware of the SQL servers. The SQL servers are aware of each other so that they know who their replication partners are and, and, and all of that. Then you get into the cross-platform story. And so maybe, you know, maybe you have a back-end web service that's running .NET, but the front end is a Java app, or it's just, or, or if it's a straight JavaScript app that's making calls back to a web API backend, and we see those cross-platform applications more and more often because you want to get the best of each technologies and you mix them. Exactly, and, and you know, you you want to be able to use different environments. You want to manage different cloud resources. You know, whether whether it's Azure, whether you're doing something internal that's providing a cloud platform environment, something like Windows Azure Pack. You want to be able to leverage those types of, of technologies as well. And so all of those different components kind of build what we want in an automation platform. And Chef, you know, Chef kind of provides that. And you also want to be predictable in what you do and, and be consistent in what you're doing. Oh, exactly. Uh, I mean, that, that consistency, that predictability, that repeatability, is key to being able to deliver, you know, quality at scale quickly. Yeah, and and the less automation you have, the more propensity you have to have glitches in what you're doing or differences in the configuration of your systems, which will create at one point problems, which will cause nightmares. Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, for me personally, when I kind of came to this configuration management space, you know, the, the kind of evolution I took was. Okay, I, I, I'm building one-off servers from memory, you know, and it's like, okay, I, I remember for deploying this app, I had to do X, Y, and Z. The lack became a little hectic, so I started building checklists, mm -hmm. you know, and then those checklists became scripts, you know, and so I would have a deployment script that would take me from a blank machine out to what I wanted to start with. Well, then, then I had, would have, oh, well, what happens now when I need to add another one to that environment? Well. Is it partially configured? Do I have do I have something that gets me all the way there, or did I do something manual after? And so, um, I went from, started going from deployment scripts into looking at configuration management technologies, and providing that consistent platform that allows me to model what I look like, my end state looks like, without actually saying specifically how to get there. Yeah, and the how to get there creates a lot of questions on where do you come from. So you have to consider all those questions on where you come from before you actually get to the point, which is getting more complex. Right, and considering all, yeah, that, that just drives this whole complexity idea, and you know, the idea is to reduce that complexity. So that's where this whole infrastructure as code concept kind of comes in. And where we want to you know, be able to uh, reduce that complexity through abstraction and this is a technology that developers have been leveraging for years and years and years. And, and, and a lot of our tooling actually uses this as well, uh, you know, creating models of how we view things. Uh, so uh, w one example in Windows Server, have you ever configured a network adapter through the mm. UI? Yeah, I think I've done it. One, 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 once or twice? <laughs> so that's an abstraction. Because when you configure, when you actually look at Windows at the Windows Server uh, IP address configuration, there is a uh, IP address and net mask and gateway, and then underneath that you'll see DNS servers that you can mm -hmm. fill in, right? Well, if you look at actually, if you dive into the, you know, either into, um, in, into uh, NetSH or into the WMI elements that represent those network configurations, they're all completely different yeah. things. Your routing tables are different than your IP address configurations. Your IP address configurations are associated to a network adapter. They're not actually part of that network adapter. And so th there's, but that UI that you get is this nice abstraction on top of those mm -hmm. concepts to make it s a, a little simpler. 
So infrastructure as code helps provide those types of abstractions. We get to programmatically provision and configure components. Uh, Chef actually is a programming language. Um, and before, you know, before people get scared by that, um, <laughs> you know, guess what? Ba uh, batch scripting and, and command.exe, that's programming. Uh, VB script, programming. It's programming. You know, we, we call it scripting in a lot of cases, but it's programming. And so infrastructure is code. So when, I, when I talk about you know, being able to programmatically do things or to treat our infrastructure as code, this isn't some scary concept that lives in the realm of developers. This is something that IT professionals can leverage and use and uh, take great advantage of. Now, we will start, we, we will start encouraging some practices that, ha that we've learned from the development world and take, bringing those into and it, to help improve our state in, in the IT pro world. Um, things like leveraging version control, leveraging testing, um, applying terms like refactoring. <laughs> you know, yeah, those are new terms for, so, for IT pros. Yeah, so you know what, version control? Version control's been used by systems administrators going back you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, if, if you were a Linux admin, that would be nothing because guess what? Everything's a config file in Linux. And it's super easy to just and you copy, check, it, you, check in, check out. Right, you can check it into version control. And version control just keeps a you know, point in time uh, set of changes uh, to files. Well, you know what? If you're writing any scripts, you should be using some sort of version control. And there's a lot of tooling out there. There's free tooling, there's some great, there's some great commercial offerings. Um, but you definitely, you know, you definitely want to get familiar with with kind of ver with version control, uh, especially if you get into the infrastructure as code space. What what this really then becomes is kind of an executable documentation, and so this will this will uh, this will sound a little bit more familiar um, when we, you know, kind of when we dive into some some deeper examples, but. What tools like Chef allow you to do when you can model your infrastructure uh, in, in kind of this you know in kind of this hierarchical manner is it allows you to uh, it, it allows you to more easily oh it allows you to more easily do things like. Uh, Ver validate what you, you had, you know, a month ago versus what your systems look like now, and, and it can also allows you to understand who has made a change. If if you have multiple people in your organization that that try to ch do changes on the infrastructure, oh yeah, uh, from a compliance point of view, it also helps to understand what happened at what point. I mean, not necessarily be compliant, but also understand when you have issues. Oh yeah, I mean that's what. So when you have a production issue. One of the first things that uh, that your developers often says, "Well, you changed something on the servers." <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. That, and that's you know, super it, familiar. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard that once or twice. And but if you're if you're managing your infrastructure through an, an automation platform like Chef, you can go back and say, "Hey, no, the server configuration hasn't changed in X amount of time." You know, or, "Oh yeah, guess what? I did make a change." And this is the change that we made, and that brought it into compliance with what we're doing in dev. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so let's make sure our, let's make sure the settings that we have uh, are, are appropriate. Yeah, and it also allows you to evolve the infrastructure as code at the same time as the code evolves, the code of the application. So, if the, the application requires a different layout of mm -hmm. the systems, you can do it at the same time and evolve the version at the same time. Oh yeah, one of one of the one of the big challenges that you have uh, when you're migrating an application from like a dev and test environment into an, a UAT or a user acceptance testing or a uh, kind of a staging environment or into production um, is the fact that hey, the developers had kind of free reign to change machines back <laughs> in back in development, and how do we? And they've handed us a requirements document that tells us what we need to do to deploy this. But does that document match what is on those systems? If we have uh, if we have our executable documentation, we know that that system state matches because we've taken the structure of what they had and applied it on our machines. Um, and, and that's that's kind of where the power of this executable documentation comes back in. And 
I know, you know, one of the first things that happens to documentation is it gets out of date. <laughs> Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I built servers and I've went back and documented them, and then something came up. I had to change it, but I never made it back to the documentation to update that. Yeah, or you even distracted, and, yeah. and you had an emergency to take care of, and you forget, and it, it got lost. Exactly. You know, your hair's on fire, or some other fi some other thing comes up, and guess what? Getting unblocking other teams ends up being more important than writing documentation. Yeah, and you know, it's like oh. No, I'm going to tell the rest of the business, you guys stop, so I can go update my wiki. And That <laughs> and doesn't it, sound like something that the business is going to accept. No, no, not at all. But if my documentation is what builds my infrastructure, there you go. Yeah. The other thing that that, uh, or another thing that that enables is it allows you to kind of reconstruct your business. It's, it's kind of a, this built-in DR plan, right? One of the most challenging things about setting up replicas of your environment is setting up replicas of your environment. <laughs> but if you, ha if you have the executable specification of what that looks like, that takes a lot of the pain out of that. You know, uh, when I was working at the police department years ago, we, we had a record management and computer aid dispatch system uh, that we were using, and it was pretty new, and so we were getting early versions of it to test. Well, the, the toughest part was standing up that separate environment to test it to make it look like production because there might have been a Word document telling us how to set up the environment, but more likely it was support was remoted into our infrastructure fixing things as we were watching. And so it was like, okay, what actually do I need to do to set this machine up? The documentation isn't quite right. And so, um, you know, as long as I have my data, if I if the important you know the data protected from my environment, if I have this executable specification, I can rebuild my environment wherever. If my data center burns down, I can spin up nodes in Azure. If you know Azure goes offline, I can order stuff from Dell and you know stand up new <laughs> <laughs> stand up new machines. But as long as I have compute resources, I can replicate my environment. And if you think a bit further, you can also do that as a practice you can even try it more often than what you would do with scripts and manual operations. And how many of us or how many of our colleagues have tried to do the disaster recovery from end to end uh, in a non-painful way? Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. And disaster recovery is one, one aspect of it, and that's something you might be able to sell to management. But another benefit of being able to replicate your infrastructure is now it's easier for me to start testing patches. It's easier for me to start testing new versions of operating systems. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you've noticed, but your company is shipping operating systems more frequently now. Yeah, and I yeah, think so. and, and and that whole it's becoming a much uh, a much quicker pipeline to getting changes out into into a production environment. So now you know where it used to be. Hey, if I got an OS. You know, it might be nine years before management tooling needed to change, because you know, I, I would be you know, the management tooling would get backported usually for like two two major versions. And if it's a three year cycle, I got I got a nine year window once I deploy. But if you're shipping operating systems every year, every year and a half, now it's a three year to four and a half year window. Mm -hmm. That's half the time I half to a third of the time that I had before. That means I need to get better about rolling out new operating systems in my environment. Well, what's what's the biggest pain in, in checking that? Replicating your environment. <laughs> so, if I, so if I can spin up a new operating system, lay down my executable specification, I can start validating, see what breaks, I can start validating those new OSs sooner. So can you tell us a bit more how Chef works on, on, on this? And sure. How Chef is actually infrastructure as code. How does it happen? You bet. So Chef, uh, Chef itself is an infrastructure as code tool. We have a domain-specific language, a DSL, and you'll probably hear that term a time or two as we talk today, um, that allows you to define policies for how you want your servers to be uh, configured. Um, and we work at the operating system level and up, and then, and then anything else that we can reach with different APIs. So, uh, and again, for the IT Pro audience, 
APIs are nothing to be scared of. Every time you use WMIC to make a call to something, you're calling APIs. Every time you every time you run a PowerShell command, guess what? That's an API. <laughs> APIs are uh, are a programming interface, and so. Uh, since scripting is programming, every time we're scripting, we're, call, we're, we're calling APIs of various things. Um, so uh, I get, I'm going to try to catch myself when I start f going into some developer speak, but living in this infrastructure as code world, you start picking up those term that, that type of terminology. And uh, I just want to make sure you know, we're, not, we, we're not scaring people off with it, because it, it is a different set of terms than what, we're normally, than what we normally play with. Um, one of the great things about Chef is versioning. So we can version policies. Like you were saying, how, how your uh, models can evolve with your application. Well, we can, we can version all of those policies, and we can constrain environments that, we, that we've defined that version 1 will be running in production. UAT will be version 1, but less than version 2. Development can be whatever you know. It might be already in version three. Right. And yeah. So, so what you can do is you uh, you can use that type of versioning to control the migration of things through your environment and leverage the same repository of of uh, cookbooks, which is where we store our policies. Um, but leverage that same store of policies across your environment or across your your total infrastructure but constrain them to only using what needs to be used in, in a particular place. Um, as we've been talking about with, uh, with configuration management uh, and infrastructure as code is we're not describing how to get there. Our policies model what we want the server to look like. Now, this is, this is something that will come up every single time I talk about this. <laughs> is So if a policy falls out of scope, does that unapply or does it roll back? Any guesses? Mm, I think it reapplies. Uh, so if a policy falls out of scope for a node, uh, unlike group policy, which will roll back, these do not. Uh, so when we're, and, and this is the same across, uh, across desired state configuration, chef, uh, puppet, a any of the config management tools that I've had any experience with, uh, there's not a native rollback. Um, and that, it's because these tools are, they're, they're positive assertion tools. So I'm going to assert that I want a web server installed. That's the state I want my machine to be in. When that falls out of scope, it doesn't say uninstall the web server. It just says, I'm not, I don't care about web servers anymore. <laughs> it's not in my model. If I want that removed, I have to make a positive assertion that I want that web server removed. So I want that web server to be absent. Um, and, and so, um, one one thing to be conscious of when 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 we're talking about describing this desired state is if we haven't talked about it we don't care about it it's not something that we it's not something that we're modeling and you know you could there are debates and there will be till the end of time uh, or at least until the end of time for configuration management tooling like this about whether or not you should have rollback policies um, i fall on the side of no um, because there's potentially lots of dependencies and things in there, and you're usually better off if, if a machine is at a point where you need to roll back. Maybe, hey, we have we have models of our infrastructure. Let's spin up a new machine, machine and, and redeploy. And, exactly. So, and, and as we say, usually you need you can think of treating your operating system as disposable, and if something is not what you want, you just destroy it and redeploy it. And that's yep. the value of automation. You can redeploy it easily. Exactly. Be because it's not a big challenge to deploy new systems, we, we become much less attached to our servers. We start, you know, one of the common phrases that circulates in this space now is, you know, treating them uh, like cattle rather than like snowflakes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, or, or, or like cattle versus like pets. You know, I'm not giving it, I'm not giving it a name. I don't care. I don't, you know, want to watch it grow and mature and, <laughs> and, and lovingly craft this thing from, from, uh, from start to finish. I want it when I need it, and when I don't, I'm going to replace it. So, uh, you know, so, so, so Chef 
provides this domain specific language. We also provide a bunch of tooling around that to uh, to manage those policies and help build and evolve those policies. And so there's a there's a whole ecosystem kind of of chef tooling. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just going to kind of run through some of the components here. And, and, and you know, starting at the at you know at where the IT pro is going to care. Uh, what do I have on my workstation? And that's the chef development kit, right? So this is a, a relatively recent, uh, a relatively recent member of our portfolio. But what we do is we've bundled uh, a chef client as well as a bunch of other tools that that can help uh, that can help you build and evolve your policies. Uh, things that would cover uh, t various testing things that you want to do, like validating syntax and making sure uh, common errors don't happen, uh, to making sure that your policies themselves um, are uh, structurally correct. And then you want to have some tool, you want to have uh, some tooling to s scaffold out things for you. So, hey, I want to create a new project so you can type a command and have that scaffolded out for you. So the Chef Development Kit is kind of all these best of breed tools bundled together in one download that you can pull down on your workstation. You don't have to go hunting for a bunch of different tools on the web. So you you basically you download an MSI, it installs on your Windows machine or, or your Mac, operating system, or Mac Linux. or Linux. Yep. And then from there you actually start creating your infrastructure. Yep, the only thing we don't p bundle with that uh, are uh, a text editor and a source control client. Those those are up to you. You can, yeah, yeah, you, can, yeah. you, can you have multiple options. You can right. find multiple of those already in the operating system or free available as a download. Right. Um, I, I, uh, one thing I will caution is, you know, when we start getting into some of the examples and things, um, Notepad isn't the best tool for for working with this. Um, but there are tons of free and open free and commercial offerings yeah. in the space. We'll come again to the Notepad thing, and yeah. maybe you can explain us why Notepad yeah. is not the best. Yep, definitely. So the next part of the infrastructure that, that matters is, so I build my policies on my local workstation, and then I, I either, or if I have some, some uh, pipeline in place to, hand, to handle this, uh, in some fashion, those policies get delivered to my chef server. I might have a workflow that they have to go through. Maybe they need to go through an approvals process. Maybe they need to go through a testing phase. Um, you know, at different organizations have different levels of rigor that they want to put that through, and different. Uh, and when you're in different phases of your adoption of chef, you're going to have a different maturity level about how you treat those things. So, so via some workflow. You're going to get, and Chef DK includes tools for you to be able to deliver those uh, policies that you've built direct to the Chef server, mm -hmm. or the, or it gives you the tools to kind of build that other pipeline. <coughs> so then we get to the Chef server. So the, now the inf the information is in the Chef server in the blue box, basically. Yep. So we, we, we've re reached the blue box. Our policies there. So Chef server is a um, is open source. Um, so one one of the things that actually uh, is a relatively recent development is we shipped Chef 12 uh, towards the end of last year, and um, Chef with Chef 12 we actually eliminated our enterprise offering. So we had a enterprise server and we had an open source server, and we decided okay everything is going to be open source, and so there is only the open source Chef server now, um, and. That's we can build on top of that with some premium features. So we do sell stuff, <laughs> um, but we are fully a subscription model now. So that we need to earn your business every day and earn our customers back, right? So um, so we have some premium features that you can uh, that are included with that enterprise support that you can add on top of mm -hmm. uh, Chef Server, or if you don't want to run your own Chef Server, we have a hosted offering. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so Chef Server provides you that repository for your policies. Mm -hmm. It's also it also has a index of all of uh, so all the nodes which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Um, there's a bunch of data that they provide as well. Yeah. Um, and that's all available on, on the chef server and accessible from anybody with, with the chef DK, chef client, or via any of our APIs. 
So there are basically everything you can do on Chef Server you can do through uh, through a programming interface as well. So policies reach Chef, uh, the Chef Server. Then we got on the uh, on the right hand side of our slide here, or left hand side, depending on which way you're looking at it. <laughs> I'm looking at it. It's my it's my uh, it's my right hand side, and we have the data center, the cloud. We have uh, a, we have our nodes, whether they live wherever they live. If they're in Azure, if they're on premise, if they're on my laptop in my backpack. You know, wherever our nodes uh, you're, live. You're carrying a note in your backpack. Okay, yeah. I, I take a note on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, care, I, care, I, I bring some nodes along with me. That's, yeah, that's, that's how I roll. Um, <laughs> so on our nodes, we have our Chef Client tool runs. Mm -hmm. And Chef Client is the engine that does actually most of the work. So w one of the things that uh, the Chef server is actually a relatively uh, dumb component. It doesn't. It doesn't make evaluations as far as what happens. It's a repository of, of things that can be queried. It, it, can, it, it will distribute policies. It will uh, provide information out to out to other nodes. But the Chef client is what does the policy evaluation. So it will contact the Chef so, server. Yeah, the Chef client contacts the server. So it gets download a list. the policy and then apply it to the system on which it runs the policy that has been downloaded. Correct. Yep. And so regardless of where it runs, it will download this policy, be able to go back to the Chef server for any additional information that it might need. Oh, yeah. The, and then, there's a two-way two, row. Yep. And then once that, once that uh, policy has been applied, that information is pushed back to the Chef server so it has the most recent uh, version of what's actually happened on that node. Um, you know, some, of, some of the tools that um, the management console will take a look at today um, in one of the later modules. Um, and then uh, high availability and replication, that's kind of uh, uh, obvious. But the analytics platform is one thing I want to mention. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, th this is really where a lot of that compliance capability comes in. This is going to give you that audit log. This gives you a, uh, a capability to respond to events as they happen. So this node failed to do something. So I want to plumb in some action to, to happen when that happens. As if, if, one of my, um, if one of my load balancers fails to configure itself, I want to notify my ops team. If, uh, you know, if, if a database server has an issue getting configured, maybe I need to notify my DBAs. So you can, you can have, some, kind of, you can have some, um, some actions there. Or if I have more than X number of nodes out of compliance, Maybe I need to notify the sysadmin team that hey, we're we're getting out of compliance and we have an audit coming up. Hmm. So, you want to have a, a human looking at it. Exactly. So, um, so the analytics platform provides that level of capability, and it's leveraging data captured by the Chef server. Mm -hmm. And no con no no talk of the Chef ecosystem would be complete without talking about our community. One of the one of the main things that drew me to Chef is the community around it. Um, I, I was uh, I was watching uh, from via Twitter and uh, and the uh, intertubes uh, the events that went on at ChefConf last year and uh, all of the positive comments when Mark Rusinovich took the stage <laughs> and was demoing Azure stuff and you know so the, the Chef community uh, at least initially was was very linux focused and uh, very uh, or very uh, unixy focused crowd and they've been known in, in that that general general group of folks has been known to be a little snarky when it comes to windows there was none of that there was oh wow this is cool stuff oh hey you can run linux on azure oh, oh hey that portal looks really, really sweet, and 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 the stuff that Chef was doing on top of Windows, leveraging things like desired state configuration and uh, and PowerShell very, very extensively. Um, that that openness to you know from the Chef community to the Windows community um, is one of the things that that kind of that drew me there, and some of the manifestations of that community are. The IRC channels, um, mm -hmm. you know, IRC is not, not necessarily a tool in every okay. in every IT pros toolbox, mm -hmm. but that's how I learned PowerShell. Yeah. There's Palm PowerShell on Freenode. Um, there's a there's a very active group of folks in there talking about PowerShell all the time. Um, so 
if you're if you're an IRC guy, then uh, there's a Pound Chef and Chef Hacking. Mm -hmm. We leverage IRC actually to run community developer meetings. So the direction of Chef is set by our community, not just our company. So you listen to the community, and that helps you go to the next step. Right. We actually have a an RFC uh, process, and that's mm -hmm. what's managed in those weekly those biweekly meetings. Um, so anybody can contribute their thoughts on what we should be doing, and those get a hear, those get heard and discussed and voted on. And we actually have community members who have commit rights into our source code, and so they can implement those things. Hmm. So we. Um, so we're, we're very community minded. Um, we also have mailing lists, but where we really get into kind of the productive sharing side of things um, it, from, a, from a config management standpoint is our, in our supermarket. And that's, that's, that's very, that's high, that's a lot of. Yeah, so I, I was kind of building up to that here. So, <laughs> so, so supermarket is a sharing site for uh, cookbooks, which are our repositories of policies, as well as other libraries and capabilities that uh, can extend your chef experience, um, and we have some in in the in the in the supermarket. But our community contributes a ton of stuff in there. Uh, you know, one of the best cookbooks for managing Windows Server update services is contributed by the community. A, there's a great Active Directory cookbook out mm -hmm. there from the community. Um, we have uh, we have a, a bunch of ones that we support internally, and my team is one of the ones that supports those. Um, but um, you know, the supermarket also has uh, a, a tools section, so you can find other tools and things related to Chef, uh, things that are not necessarily in, in, installed with Chef DK. So, so but it's it's a great. Uh, it's a great community resource, and it is the uh, the public. There's the public supermarket, and you can run supermarket internally. So I I don't know about you, but um, I like not having my build and deploy process for machines dependent on the internet. Um, even if I'm running in Azure, for example, right? I, I'm going. I want to have a local copy of things. I right. like to control what's going and what's going to happen on my systems, of course. Right. So, so what what supermarket allows you is to run that repository internally as well. So, uh, so you can host the cookbooks that you want to host. You can have the tools that you want to have in there, and and have those more avail. Then you're responsible for the availability of that to your infrastructure, uh, versus you know relying on a third party service. Uh, so that that's it. It's like, just like running a WSUS server. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to actually go out to the internet every time I need to get Microsoft updates. I want to download them once and distribute them internally. And then that way, my patching isn't held up by my internet connectivity. And yeah, similar philosophy. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so that's one of, the, one of the nice things about Supermarket that uh, I want to make sure I mention. Just like Chef Server, you can run a local, and, and it actually runs in conjunction with Chef Server. So you stamp Chef Server, Stamp supermarket. So, okay, we've we've understood how the community works. You know, you understand. We understand how the architecture is uh, for Chef. Uh, can you tell us a bit more how Chef helps reducing the complexity and have that abstraction layer? Um, how does this work? Sure, definitely. So, there, there's that. Uh, there's a bunch of terms I'm going to start throwing some definitions on here up on the board now. And, and, and we'll drill down into each of those terms in the next module. Yes, yep, we're going to, we're, we're going to drill down much deeper into these things you know, in the next modules. But just to kind of put some context around them now, uh, resources, these are our primitives that we work with. Um, and, and they model one particular aspect of, uh, of something. So one, a resource might be a package like uh, Say, for example, um, a text editor, like Vim. Yeah, if, if you want to go, go, for example, <laughs> you know, for example, we have we have a resource. Uh, we have a, uh, or maybe a, maybe represents a file, file or a service or a user. 
you know, those things are all, there, there's a number of resources that, that are just natively available to Chef Client, and then cookbooks can add to those. So basically, it is the definition of an object, -ish, -ish, if I can try to yep. make that comparison? Yep, it, it's an abstraction of, uh, uh, of the end state of a particular resource, that, or of a particular, you know, uh, of some capability that we want to expose on the service. Because um, there's, there is a resource that models Azure storage, for example. That's not something on my local machine, but I can have a policy on my machine that goes and manages that storage. Mm -hmm. So uh, then we can move up, we move up the chain just a little bit. And that's recipes. Mm -hmm. So you may detect the theme here, right? Uh, chef, recipes, uh, cookbooks. Yeah, I, the, uh, being a French, I can get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so with recipes, what we have is uh, <laughs> recipes are collections of resources. And recipes in Chef are ordered. So uh, if you've had experience with desired state configuration, one of the things that, that's kind of right out there is order, is not, uh, order of, your, uh, of your resources in, in DSC is not guaranteed. So you have this depends on clause that you can yeah. use to, to, to create the dependencies. To, to create that order. By default, Chef is ordered. Uh, I like to kind of think of this as kind of the principle of least surprise. If I wrote it down in this order, I expect it to happen in this order. So recipes, uh, recipes are collections of resources. It can be one or more resources that just will get our systems to a particular state. Cookbooks are collections of recipes at their very basic. There, there's other things that can live in cookbooks, uh, attributes, which, are, uh, which we're talking about next, um, but as well as uh, resources. So we can have, uh, cookbooks are just a way to package functionality. If you have a PowerShell background, think of a, uh, as, of a resource as a DSC resource, a recipe as like a PowerShell script or a, a configuration or a configuration document um, or a composite configuration. Uh, it, it's kind of nebulous yeah. there. And then a cookbook would be the PowerShell module hosting all of that. Yeah. And then, then we get into attributes, yeah. right? So attributes are bits of data that we can provide to a cookbook uh, or to a recipe to uh, to modify how it behaves. Mm -hmm. So our cookbook can re or our recipe can represent the structure of what we're going to model, and the attributes provide kind of that, those bits of, uh, of data that we need. Like for example, if I'm configuring a web server, what's my connection string? What's my host headers? You know, those aren't you don't want to necessarily you know hand write those into your recipes. You're going to provide those as data that can be changed. And you don't necessarily want to have to create one recipe per system that you're deploying. So you want to be able to reuse something that you have done and like variables. Exactly. Exactly. Um, the other key component of attributes is that these are indexed by the chef server. So this stuff all becomes searchable. So later you can on. search them and yeah. Yep. So I want to find out how many mach machines are have this have this connection string. You know, and find out, make sure, you know, because, hey, maybe we had a catastrophic failure with our SQL server and we need to hot change things over. And until, until we can get things to the pipeline, we need to find out who's pointing there. Yeah. Uh, data bags. An important one. Yes. So have you ever played Dungeons & Dragons? Uh, a while ago, yeah. <laughs> so uh, in, in, in that ecosystem, there is, a, uh, there is a, this... Uh, Magical object called a bag of holding, <laughs> which and that's reminding me of something. Yeah, it, and, and I, honestly, I, I learned this. I, I learned this reference uh, about two weeks ago uh, when, when when we were talking about at, at our uh, at our chef all our employee meetup. We had a little uh, talk about some of the history of things at Chef, and so uh, this comes out of, out of this bag of holding concept, where it was a bag of a certain size and a certain weight that you could just store as much stuff in as you wanted. It, you could take this bag that was probably, you know, maybe a, a foot high and stuff a, a <laughs> three foot long sword in it and it wouldn't, you know, it would just hold whatever you put into it. So data bags are basically that. You can stuff as much data as you want in there. Mm -hmm. And this is not associated with any particular node or role or environment. There, it's just data that's kind of there off to the side that can be referenced. And any of your um, any of your recipes can search against yeah. data bags. Yeah. Um, roles, mm -hmm. they those allow us to uh, to basically create run lists 
Run lists are lists of recipes to run or to, to do, and to give them a nice little name. So yeah, you can define like a web server yep. or a database. Yep. Or you know, one of the first things I usually encourage people to do is to create a base role and do all your common configuration tasks in that. And then that base role can get included in other roles. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to, you know, you, in your web server role, you don't have to have configure page file and configure one. Yeah, that, that's basically the baseline, and you can build, build on that baseline. Yep. So, um, so roles give you that capability. You can also, you can also set some some attributes mm -hmm. at the role level. Um, if you have like all my web servers are going to, they need to report their forward their event logs or their syslog to a particular node. You know, yeah. uh, or you know, you can you can do things like that. Um, then we have environments. One of the common scenarios when people talk about environments is I have my dev, my QA, my staging, or UAT, uh, user acceptance testing, or my production. That's fine. You can use those for environments. You might have my internal, my internal production versus my Azure production, my internal testing versus Azure staging versus uh, whatever. It, an environment is... Uh, allows us to constrain uh, to constrain what version of cookbooks are available there, as well as to specify some some run lists, as well as to specify some attributes. Mm -hmm. So we can basically package some data around environments. Um, then we get organizations. Organizations exist at the chef server level, and uh, where you really see this is on hosted chef. This is what makes the chef server multi-tenant. Uh, in, an, uh, in an enterprise, it could allow you to aggregate everything we've talked about already before. Already, yep. like you aggregate all of that in one single bag that is isolated from the others. Yep. So, uh, or, so if you have if you have a user account on a Chef server, you may have rights in one organization. You may have no rights in another organization. You know, think Active Directory forests, right? With no trusts. Yep. Yeah. The, <laughs> and and so you can be given. Uh, you can be given rights in these other mm -hmm. organizations, but there's nothing else shared between them. If I upload a cookbook to one organization, no other organization has that cookbook. So these things, these are, are, are hard administrative boundaries. Uh, but it, if you if you need to, for compliance reasons, say our devs are going to work against this. <laughs> Our, you know, our operations people are going to work against this particular one. This, our security group has a different for their testing environment. You can have those all consolidated in one Chef server ecosystem, with the hard administrative boundaries that so that no one can put their fingers in other people's pies. Yeah, sounds sounds useful from time to time. Yeah, it, and you know, so you can use, so you could use environments and you could use organizations. And you can use roles to do all sorts of segmentation, and there's some overlap in them. And and what's going to fit your organization isn't necessarily going to be what fits my organization. The nice thing about Chef is it's flexible enough to accommodate that. You know, it, um, that's also one of the tough things because people say, "Well, how should I do this?" Well, it mm. depends. <laughs> yeah, uh, let, let's have the, let's have a conversation about what your environment is like. Then we can make that determination. You know, it, th there's not one particular best structure, but there there will be a best structure for your scenario. And then the last thing is search. I mentioned this a couple times already. But pretty much everything within an organization is searchable mm -hmm. by a node. So um, one thing I forgot to mention about data bags, you can stick encrypted stuff in there. So there, there are tools. Uh, there, there's uh, Out of the box, there's this encrypted data bag concept. Mm -hmm. And then there's tools like Chef Vault to, uh, that can help make managing the security of that a little bit more granular. Uh, but you can stick encrypted stuff in a data bag and then decrypt it out on the client so that it is when it's it, it's not it's only it's only uh, decryptable by who needs it Good. Um, and, but then search allows you to search across pretty much you can search across roles you can search across cookbooks you can search nodes so nodes when they check into the chef server upload a ton of, of uh, data through one of the uh, through a profiling tool so you want to find out all the nodes of the particular processor type or of a certain patch level or uh, that have a certain uh, language installed at a certain version. 
any any of that type of stuff becomes searchable and actionable. Mm -hmm. So ser search is a pretty powerful tool in, in, to help reduce complexity. Once the thing that kind of highlights it is search is usable in recipes. So think if I have a web server that, uh, or uh, a web server farm, right? And I deploy five new nodes. Either I have to go back and tell my load balancers, hey, there's these five new nodes you can distribute stuff to, or I have in my uh, config for my load balancer a search for all the nodes that are configured with the role web server, and then when the chef client runs, it will dynamically search, determine which nodes are all web servers, and reconfigure itself to distribute load across them. And that's where, that's, that's one of the most kind of compelling complexity reduction uh, stories you have because now I'm not maintaining these lists that I need to shuffle around. Um, pretty pretty useful when you have like to scale out, or when you have a dynamic infrastructure that needs to scale up, to scale out or in. Yep, and well, and, and when you want to stop caring about individual machines, because now that search can return the IP address of that node or the name of that node or uh, you know some identifier for it to be able to to make that connectivity mm -hmm. to it. So. Uh, you know, and, and complexity is what builds up at scale. So search is one of our one of our handy tools for combating that. One of the things I like to say about Chef, you know, it, is that it helps make cloud attainable. And you you were asking me about this earlier today, like, you know, what what did you mean by that? And everybody can a, anybody can use a cloud. You can go, you know, providers offer free trials. You know, you can. You can get like Azure credits you know, just by signing up. You get a, you get a, you get some free trial time. Uh, like Azure websites, you can just kind of use for free um, if you, if you're within you know the t tolerances of of how you want to run your site. But the biggest hurdle for existing businesses, my experience, has been it's going to be a lot of work for me to, to take and figure out what I've got running in my environment and duplicate that in Azure, or duplicate that in some other cloud environment, mm -hmm. or duplicate that in Azure Pack on-premise. Because now I need to kind of shift some, some of my infrastructure models, but I also need to replicate the existing config on these boxes. And so if you start using Chef to manage your environment, and you start segregating stuff out by attributes, using that, like we were saying, you, know, you could use attributes to say, Hey, uh, your your web server uh, or, or your your uh, SQL Server database is over here, and you know if you're in production, you're using this SQL Server. If you're in test, you're using this one. Uh, if you're now, you could start saying stuff like, if you're in Azure, use SQL Azure as your backend. Mm -hmm. If you're in our local data center, you're using uh, DB01. Yeah, <laughs> you have the choice, right? Uh, so, but by by pulling that out into attributes, I can override that now at at the role level or at the environment level, mm -hmm. or I can wrap it in another cookbook that just provides those attributes. And attributes have an inher uh, have an inheritance uh, scale. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to scare you with the there's. We have a slide in our training deck <laughs> that's got uh, the 15 levels of inheritance for uh, attributes. Uh, that's that's a different discussion. That's a completely <laughs> different discussion. Um, for most purposes, you just need to know that there's a default attribute, which most cookbooks have, like some sane defaults. Like if I just run this cook, if I just run this recipe, it'll do kind of just the general use case. But then you can override those, and so the, the uh, override is another common one. Um, but we can so we can use those overrides at the role and environment level or with with cookbooks to kind of segregate all that data out so that. I'm just modeling the structure of how I want my operating systems to be built, and then all that other data can just get injected based on what environment I'm in. And that helps make that story of, well, if this is how I'm deploying my servers internally, I just need to change you know, five bits of data, and now I can deploy to Azure, or now I can deploy to Windows Azure Pack. And you know, or, or hey, we got this cool new CPS, the Cloud Platform <laughs> System rack uh, stood up now, and uh, we paid a lot of money for it, so we should probably use it. <laughs> um, yeah, so th this kind of helps get that story going for you. Mm -hmm. You know, some of, uh, and then, you know, you have so you have those core concepts in Chef that help you make that uh, make those abstractions so that you can use those, those configurations multiple places. 
then there's some tooling to help make that deployment much more uh, much smoother. Mm -hmm. So uh, Knife is a command line tool that ships with Chef Client and Chef DK. So everyone knows that chefs have lots of knives, and knife's kind of your general purpose tool as a chef. And you need a specific knife for each type of exactly. product you're, you're yeah. working. So, uh, so there's a knife Azure plugin, mm -hmm. and then there's a knife cloud plugin, which is uh, kind of intended to abstract all of the all the different cloud plugins that we have. So we have plugins for you know for AWS or Rackspace or you know whomever, um, but. We also have uh, something that's a, a project. A project that's uh, kind of oops, uh, a project that's kind of coming up is our is Chef provisioning, and that has drivers for Azure. That has drivers for for uh, other other types of provisioning systems uh, like uh, Fog, which is an open source uh, OS distribution. So you can distribute deploy to bare metal and deploy to VMs. But that's that's under development, right? Right. That, that's under active development right now. Um, but uh, that's something to kind of keep an eye on because mm -hmm. um, that allows you to define your infrastructure as a recipe. Yeah, we'll we'll probably come to that at some point in the at future. At some point in the future. Yep. And then the last mm -hmm. thing you know to kind of enhance that cloud experience is uh, there are cookbooks that add that capability. One uh, one common one when working with Azure is the Microsoft Azure cookbook, mm -hmm. and that actually gives. So, so I said cookbooks could provide resources and other libraries of things to use. That cookbook actually provides uh, primitives for working with Azure Storage and SQL Azure. So that's probably a cookbook we'll have a deeper look in the coming modules. Definitely. Good. Um, thanks. Thanks, Steve. It's a good overview of Chef. Uh, we've, we've had a good understanding on how Chef works, the different attributes, the different uh, terms we can use. Um, uh, in the next modules, we're going to drill more into how you use it. And stay tuned for more info on how to use Chef. Awesome.